everyone and welcome to this video tutorial in which we're going to be applying the law on Rylands and Fletcher to an A-level law exam question and this would potentially come up on your taught law exam. Now I do have some other videos on my channel which go through all of the legal principles and the key cases um, and the law on Rylands and Fletcher if you need a refresher on that first. But just as a brief recap, liability under Rylands and Fletcher is now regarded as a particular type of nuisance. And it's a form of strict liability in that our defendant may be liable in the absence of any negligent conduct on their part. And imposing liability without proof of negligence is quite controversial and therefore a restrictive approach has been taken to Rylands and Fletcher and hopefully you remember from your studies that lots of exceptions or defences have arisen to this tort because of that. So that's just something to bear in mind when we look at the scenario on the next slide. The exam scenario that we're going to be looking at today on Rylands and Fletcher, and here are the facts. Chemicase keeps chemicals outside the back door while repairs are taking place to their premises. Some of the containers are rusty. Vandals also knock over some of the containers and unscrew the caps. The chemicals seep out and ruin flowers in a neighbouring garden centre and you're being asked to advise Chemicase of their liability in tort. Notice again that the question itself doesn't tell you that you need to apply the law on Rylands and Fletcher. Sometimes it'll tell you in the exam to apply that, other times it won't. So hopefully from looking at these facts that we've been given, you'd have deduced that we've got an escape of something potentially dangerous onto neighbouring land, so that certainly looks like Rylands and Fletcher. In order to get a good answer to that Rylands scenario, you need to follow the same steps that we always use when we're applying the law, whatever the area, whether it be tort, contract, criminal. If you follow IDEA, um, to remind you of the steps, you should hopefully get a nice answer to the question. So the word idea, the first letter of each word, stands for a step that you need to take. So you firstly need to identify who your potential defendant is, who your claimant is, what area of law it is you're going to be applying. You then need to define that particular area of law. You then need to explain that area of law using the key cases, and then you need to apply that back to your characters in your scenario. On this slide, I've done a bullet point answer to the Rylands and Fletcher scenario, and you can see that I've put in red font the steps from IDEA so that you can follow where I've identified, defined, explained and applied the law. Now, my answer is very bullet pointy, just so that I could fit it all on this one slide for you. But obviously, in the exam, you need to be writing in full sentences and outlining the principles from the key cases that I've just listed here. Now, you'll notice that on my answer, I've put all of the E in one chunk here and then all of the A in one chunk here. And when you first start out in law, when you're using the idea structure, it's easiest to structure your answer like this. But once you get confident with this idea structure, instead of doing the E in one big chunk and then the A in one big chunk afterwards, it actually flows better and it's nicer to read and you're less likely to miss points. If you explain a point, apply it. Explain a point, apply it. So in essence, you've got E, A, E, A throughout your answer. But to keep it simple and so it's clear on this slide, I've got all of my explanation here and all of my application at the bottom. And it's fine to do it like this in the exam because you'll still have covered all the key points. You'll still get the full marks if you've covered all the key cases and you've applied it. But if you were to run out of time in the exam, um, say you run out of time here, if you've just chunked it and not done any application, you're going to lose all of your application marks. So that's just something to think about when you're practicing doing these um, exam type questions. 
So the first thing I've done is identified what's going on in the scenario. So I've said chemicase might be liable under Rylands and Fletcher for the spillage of the chemicals. And notice that I've said might be liable at this point. Now, I've already got in my mind that I don't think they are going to be, but I'm still saying that they might be at this stage because I'm going to show all of my working and then reach my conclusion. So that's just a nice uh, little tip. Say that they might be liable, even if you're sure what the answer is at the start. And because I've identified that the rule in Rylands and Fletcher is what's relevant here, I then need to define Rylands and Fletcher. And in my definition, I would say that in the case of Rylands and Fletcher, 1868, it was a House of Lords decision. Four requirements were identified by the court for liability in this tort. So the first requirement is accumulation of something on the defendant's land. It's likely to do mischief if it escapes. It's a non-natural use of the land and the damage must not be too remote. So that's your causation element. So once you've defined the four requirements, you then need to explain those requirements in more detail with your cases. So by listing them in your definition, that's quite nice in a way because it sort of gives you a, an essay plan for the order that you need to follow in your explanation. So on to the explanation then. The first thing is that something must have been collected on the land. Another word for that is accumulation. So the defendant must bring the hazardous thing or the hazardous material onto his land and keep it there. And if the thing is already on the land or it's naturally occurring, no liability is going to arise. Um, under Rylands and Fletcher. And you could talk about the cases of Giles and Walker there and Miles and Forrest Granite. And if you remember the case of Giles and Walker, what happened there was some seeds from some thistles on the defendant's land blew into the neighbouring land owned by the claimant and damaged his crops. Now, the defendant wasn't liable because he himself hadn't brought the thistles onto his land. They were naturally occurring and there was no liability under the rule um, in Rylands and Fletcher there. So that just illustrates the point that it must have been accumulated or collected on the land by the defendant. Now, our next rule is where there's been lots of complication um, or difficulty I suppose in um, the definition in the law and this is this is often the case where you've got an old case um, coming up with a rule it used the phrase that there has to be non-natural use of the land so that's posed some difficulty for the courts in the cases so in Rylands and Fletcher it was held that there must be a non-natural use of the land so the defendant must have brought something onto the land and used that thing in a way which is unnatural on the land that he or she owns. And examples of natural uses of land, which come from the cases, are things like having water piped into your house, um, having electricity brought into your house, fire in a fireplace, etc. And you can talk about some of the key cases um, that have come up on this area, such as um, Cambridge Water and Rickards and Lothian. And our next rule is that the thing must be likely to do mischief if it escapes. And this, again, is an interesting requirement because it could be misleading um, because the thing need not be inherently hazardous per se. It need only be a thing likely to cause damage if it escapes. So a good case to use as an example of this would be Hale and Jennings Brothers. And in that case, if you remember, the defendant operated a chair a plane roundabout at a fairground, and one of the chairs actually broke loose from the roundabout, flew through the air, hit the claimant, and this was held to amount to an escape for the purposes of Rylands and Fletcher, and the defendant was liable for the personal injury sustained. So obviously in day to day life, we wouldn't say that a chair is likely to do mischief. But of course, in this context, a chair that's being held by chains on a roundabout that spins around quite quickly, the chair in that context 
is likely to do mischief if it escapes. And our next rule is that it must have escaped and caused damage. And this is remoteness or the remoteness test that we apply for causation. So firstly, there must be an escape from the defendant's land and an injury inflicted by the accumulation or the collection of a hazardous substance on the land itself won't invoke liability under Rylands and Fletcher. And we also need to be sure that any damage caused was not too remote. In other words, it was reasonably foreseeable. And a nice case to help you explain remoteness here would be um, the Cambridge Water and Eastern Counties leather case, because in that case, the defendant owned a leather tanning business. And if you remember, spillages of small quantities of solvents occurred over a very long period of time. They were seeping through the floor into the soil below, and they eventually made their way into the borehole, which was owned by the claimant water company. And the borehole had to be closed when water was contaminated beyond um, a safe level. Now, it was held in that case that Eastern Counties Leather were not liable because the damage was too remote. And it wasn't reasonably foreseeable that these tiny spillages would result in the closing of the borehole. And the foreseeability of the type of damage is a prerequisite for liability in actions of nuisance and for claims based on the rule in Rylands and Fletcher in the same way as it applies to claims based in negligence. So you can also talk about um, the wagon mound as well, which you'll remember hopefully from negligence when you're talking about remoteness of damage. And then, as I alluded to at the start, there are lots of defences um, to liability in Rylands and Fletcher. Um, courts typically don't really like this talk, so lots of defences have arisen. Now, I've not listed them all here. You wouldn't be expected to go through them all in the exam, but I've put some of the key ones on. But some defences to um, Rylands and Fletcher would be act of a stranger, wrongful act of a third party, act of God, statutory authority, consent or benefit, contributory negligence. So you can see quite a restrictive approach is going to be taken. Now, in our particular scenario, act of a stranger is involved. So that's going to be particularly relevant when we're applying the law here for Kemmer case. And the case of Rickards and Lothian is going to be a case that we are going to want to apply to our scenario. So let's get on to the application then. So we're going to go through all these steps or all, all of these rules, I should say, that we've just explained. We're going to apply each of those to Kemmer case's case. So firstly, we can say that chemicase collected or accumulated chemicals on their land. Um, and these chemicals are not naturally found there, like in Giles and Walker. You know, it's not a thistle growing in your garden type situation. They have collected things that aren't found there. Chemicals, we can say, are non-natural. They're a non-natural use of the land. Um, and you could talk about the case of Cambridge water again for that point. Um, chemicals are toxic, therefore they are likely to do mischief if they escape. The chemicals actually do escape from the land because they're spilled, they seep next door, they damage the plants um, at the neighbouring garden centre, so that requirement is also met. Now, personal injury isn't recoverable in Rylands, but damage to the flowers is, and you could use Transco there. Um, and there's no personal injury happening in this scenario, of course, but it's just a nice point to make um, that potentially damage to the flowers could be recoverable. But in Chemicase's case, they do have a potential defence of act of a stranger. And this is where you're going to apply Rickards and Lothian, because in the scenario that we looked at, um, somebody came onto Chemicase's land, they unscrewed the lids um, to the chemical tubs, and that was what allowed the chemicals to spill out. So it's useful to outline the facts of Rickards and Lothian here. 
And in this case, the claimant ran a business from the second floor of a building and the defendant owned the building and leased different parts to other business tenants. And an unknown person had blocked all of the sinks in the lavatory on the fourth floor, turned on all the taps. It reminds me of um, Home Alone in this case, um, the wet bandits turned on all the taps and that caused a flood and this damaged the claimant's stock and the claimant brought an action based on Rylands and Fletcher. And our defendants were not liable in this case because the act which caused the damage was a wrongful act by a third party or a wrongful act by a stranger. There's a real overlap between those um, and there was no natural use of the land also um, in the case of Rickards. But what that case illustrates for us here is that this person that's come and unscrewed the, the tops of the chemicals, they've done a very similar thing to the people blocking the sinks in records. So therefore, in my conclusion, I'm going to say that chemicals are not going to be liable because the chemical spillage was caused by the deliberate act of a third party and the defendant, chemicals couldn't have known about this couldn't have known it was going to happen. So there's my conclusion then um, on the chemicase scenario. I hope that's been useful to you. I've just noticed actually, um, as I've been going through this, these little ones in brackets here, and you might be wondering what they are. Um, don't worry about those numbers. They're still on there from um, when I was teaching this with a class, we had a rough mark scheme and I was giving them marks for a particular thing, but you don't need to worry about that. So that's the structure. You're identifying, you're defining, you're explaining, and you're applying it back to your scenario. I hope that was helpful to you. Remember, I do have lots of other videos on my channel which go through more of the law on Rylands and Fletcher. Um, I've got more application videos in that playlist as well. And I've got other videos which go through other areas of law, which hopefully will help you with your exam preparation. Please do subscribe to my channel and like videos if you like them, because that helps me to make more content for you.